Welcome to News Talk with Simone Ivani at the International News Channel. A senseless, despicable and tragic murder out of Islamabad has left the country of Pakistan and the international community shaking. 27-year-old Noor Mukaddam, the daughter of Pakistan's former ambassador to South Korea and Kazakhstan, Shokat Mukaddam, was found shot and beheaded on July 20th. The prime suspect, Zahir Jaffer, who was a friend of the victim, was arrested a day later. Unfortunately, this incident of brutality is just one of many acts of violence committed against women in the nation in recent days. This has left many activists wondering how many more women must die before Pakistanis and their government will implement serious change to this misogynistic culture. Many factors, including the patriarchal attitude in Pakistan, is enabling men to treat women in a demeaning manner. This attitude is only made worse by Prime Minister Imran Khan's victim blaming. Imran Khan once stated, if a woman is wearing very few clothes, it will have an impact on the men, unless they are robots. He has also suggested that there is a rise in sexual violence in Pakistan because of a lack of parda. Parda is a religious and social practice of female seclusion prevalent among some Muslim communities that require women to be dressed in such a way that they are fully covering their skin and concealing their form. Joining us to discuss this incident and matter further is Ms. Raham Khan. Khan is a British Pakistani journalist, author and filmmaker as well as Prime Minister Imran Khan's former wife. Raham Khan is a visionary woman who has never capitulated on matters that are against basic human rights and morality. She is a strong proponent of sustainable improvement in Pakistan through education, engagement, inspiration, innovation and empowerment opportunities for all, especially the youth. Thank you for joining us today and agreeing to speak with me, Ms. Khan. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I guess right off the bat, I want to ask you, what was your reaction to hearing about Noor's murder? So uh, I heard about it on the media, and as I was hearing it, I heard family and friends in Islamabad um, know, uh, they, they know her personally. Obviously, she's, uh, um, she, she was a really well-loved figure in, in uh, sort of Islamabad diplomatic circles, as well as, you know, in my family and friends. And everyone described her as a very lovely, very likable, and a very affectionate young woman. And uh, so since then, I was sort of, you know, initially what you heard on the news and then rather gory, uh, painful details of what um, the friends were telling me. And, and then I had um, uh, someone sort of, you know, we were all so affected by it that I sat down and I, I thought that I wouldn't look at the pictures and I wouldn't look at her pictures and I wouldn't write about it. But sort of in the middle of the night, I just I just couldn't help myself and I, I had to. You know, I was writing in my head and I thought I might as well just sit up and put pen to paper. And as I did that and I sent it um, to to be published, I had uh, someone from my family uh, who is also in the diplomatic circle and their daughter wrote a very, very touching, you know, tribute to Noor. And so, so many lives touched by this youngster. And I think um, it's just that we have, you know, we have young girls I have young daughters myself, and the fact that I didn't really want them to know about this because the fear that women experience as it is, and the fact that this is a privileged a young woman from a from an elite sort of society uh, who we fail to protect as a society, we failed her in so many ways, and so that just meant that I just couldn't sleep, and 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 for the first couple of nights it. It meant it was just, you know, inexplicable because every time you talk about it, every time you discuss it, um, you get triggered. And so it affects us all, um, even those who've never seen her or never, you know, even looked at her picture. And the initial photograph that I saw, I, I didn't know which one of the girls she was. And there were four girls in the picture and they were all smiling and they were with friends. And, and I honestly, it could be any one of them. That's the first thought that came to me that, you know, they're all Noor, they all could be Noor. And that's what we need to be very, very, um, um, you know, uh, mentally prepared for yeah. or shouldn't be. Yeah, no, absolutely. How does Noor's murder fit into a larger problem within the culture? By this, I mean, do you think that this is an outlier incident or part of a larger problem? So I think what Noor's uh, incident has done is the fact that it comes from an elite privileged uh, circle of society. Um, you find that the story means that the perpetrator of violence is educated, 
uh, comes from a from an elite background himself. Uh, and that, I think, has made people really sit up and, and think deeply about the issue. The fact that it comes from a certain privileged, higher socioeconomic order means that it has got a lot more uh, traction, a lot more coverage in social media, and a lot more coverage as a result on mainstream media. Now, these sort of incidents are pretty, you know, pretty common in Pakistan and other places in the world. We know for a fact that most homicides or extreme or very violent crime against women, be it the, be it uh, the United States of America or Canada or the UK or elsewhere, and of course Indo Pak, uh, tends to be from their intimate partners. Uh, Ninety-seven percent uh, of cases uh, of, of violence against women come from their intimate partners or people that they know, acquaintances, or or maybe a father or a brother or someone that they know mm -hmm. in the home. This has highlighted the case because of where it comes from. And so a lot more educated people, a lot more people of privilege are writing about it, are um, going through severe anguish and anxiety and fear and anger. This means that in the larger picture, those women whose cases are ignored, not reported, or perhaps not given that much attention will finally get some attention. So there is also this, um, it brings... Uh, us to the rather painful question that those women who perhaps do not have friends and activists or educated people to to fight their corner or fight their cause uh, do go unreported and, and, and are very forgettable. Um, so uh, for me, I know for a fact this is this is the domain that I work in, and sadly, this is not just the odd case. It's it's. Uh, uh, it's very much uh, something that we have to live with in India and Pakistan, particularly, and in Bangladesh. I think that a lot more work needs to be done. Advocacy needs to be done. Uh, we need stronger laws. We do need the, the mindset to change, uh, certainly, because it, mm -hmm. it has to be pointed out that the sort of comments that have come out of uh, different uh, you know, people on social media, on Twitter, for example, and on mainstream media, are not helpful. They might come from a good place. I'm not saying that they're not well intentioned, but the choice of words has been fairly shocking. And and even in death, it seems that the woman is being shamed or blamed for her actions and not the perpetrator of violence. And so I think this has opened a debate, uh, and it must continue that this is this is a, a huge problem. It is not an isolated case. It is not specific to Islamabad. It is not specific to Pakistan. It is actually a huge problem where I find that not only all levels of uh, uh, Pakistani society need to come together, but also other countries, because clearly we have overlaps with with uh, past track, uh, you know, past record of violence or past history of violence or even mental disorders that goes ignored, overlooked. And I think that we need to work together if, if anything is more important uh, right now, I think people have their priorities in, in the wrong order. Surely the protection of women should be our topmost, foremost uh, mm -hmm. priority, uh, whether it's in the US, the UK, or, or India and Pakistan. And we need to cooperate about perpetrators of violence and their past histories. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. So as per your knowledge, how is violence against women handled in Pakistani context today? So the first thing that I said is advocacy. We need to be very sensitive about the use of language. One of the first things that we noticed, and I've written about this extensively before also, and particularly about Noor, is the fact that when media reports these crimes against uh, against women, uh, that the, the, the lack of sensitivity in the wording that they use, and this is true for even the way it's reported in the West, um, there was a recent uh, incident in the UK where the BBC was criticized for the way they use the words. The words that you use to report violence against women must be sensitive. And certainly in Pakistan, we have seen no uh, concerns and no sort of, you know, gender training or, or sensitivity training when reporting anything, uh, for example, rapes or, or homicides or or violence against women. And one of the most shocking things was that when we see um, uh, the abusers or the murderers come out for appearances at court and we have people who have been given a mic and a camera uh, at their disposal, but they've not been 
trained uh, in, in the use of language and, and the sort of questions that are being asked are distasteful and shocking to say the very least. Is she your girlfriend? Was she your girlfriend? And, and, and honestly, I, I, it angers me and I'm sure that a lot of people have been absolutely shocked at the distasteful um, choice of words. But also when I see good intentioned people on Twitter suggesting that it is um, the, the, the act of going out of the house or going meeting friends or sleepovers, for example, that are in any way responsible or in any way protect women, I, I just really, really sort of, you know, uh, think that we have serious work to do about an awareness. You cannot, you cannot back away women in like boxes and cages mm. and say, well, don't go out, uh, don't, don't, don't go out to work, don't go out to meet friends, uh, don't dream about falling in love or, or having relationships or, or getting married. Surely this, this comes from a lack, complete lack of awareness uh, and, and a lack of sensitivity. Most women in, in any country, particularly in India and Pakistan, are murdered or attacked in the confines of their own homes by their husbands by their family and and how can you protect someone uh if they're not safe within their home so yeah. i find that that is the first thing that we need to address mm -hmm. as per your knowledge how has noor's case been handled so far so i think that it was because of social media and again i think because of uh noor coming from a, a position of privilege mm -hmm. uh, i think that had this been uh it's it's debatable that had this been someone from a very poor background or from a remote area in Pakistan, how quickly would we have seen a first incident report being lodged? How quickly would we have seen action being taken? But the fact that social media made a lot of noise, a lot of educated people got involved, uh, just goes to show uh, that there is, uh, you know, there, there are variations in the sort of justice you will get and, and the speed um, of justice that you will receive. Even here, there was there was a lot of concern that, uh, you know, perhaps justice might not be served. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't know what word should I use. Should I say that I'm happy that they've taken swift uh, action on this? Mm -hmm. Surely that should be standard. So there's nothing to be happy about. There's nothing to celebrate that you got the perpetrator, that you got the parents, and that you get, got to the bottom of the case fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. I think that the credit goes to the activism in society, but they will not be active about every case. There has to be better... Uh, um, action as standard practice. They have to be standard operating procedures where Twitterati doesn't have to force you into action. They may not know about other noors. They might not know of a noor in Dera Ismail Khan. They might not know of mm -hmm. a noor in Mitti. And, and this must must not be a case where Raham Khan tweets about it and the CM Punjab takes notice and the Prime Minister. It, it has to be uh, taken more seriously where there are women protection centers, where there are uh, telephone helplines for women to call, where there, there's awareness in school to teach our girls what is wrong, what is acceptable, what falls into the domain of controlled behavior, uh, violent behavior. And like I said, there needs to be more cooperation about does this person have a past history when particularly they're dealing with other members of society and in this case we see that it was actually to do with counseling services mm -hmm. so i'm shocked at the fact that we have our priorities all over the place mm -hmm. surely this kind of information should be shared between countries between states and and i find that this is the right time perhaps um uh, to, to perhaps address these issues they need to be more um you know better laws and they need to be implemented and they need to be implemented for everyone regardless of what socioeconomic class they belong to. No, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. After everything you've just said, what do you hope the outcome of Noor's case will be? Well, I hope that, you know, one of the things which, uh, which, which, which I suppose is, is, is a positive from this is that a lot of women who have been fearing this, and, and, and you know, I think about how many women will now uh, really, the first reaction that I've heard young women uh, come out with is the fact that, you know, how can we trust any man uh, if an educated man or if someone that you've known for a long time can do, can go that far, 
you know, it's a it's a gruesome murder. It's 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 really quite uncomfortable to repeat those details. And I think that a lot of women are very scared. And and instead of realizing where that pain, where that anger, where that bitterness comes from, we have a backlash against those women. If women are saying that, oh my God, are all men the same? All men are the same. It's because they're scared. And it's because they're just one too many incidents, which means that there's a lived in experience that has to be has to be acknowledged. And so it comes from a place of suspicion. If my 18 year old, my 24 year old is scared of leaving the home, if they're scared of making friends, of going out to work, walking back home, then even if they are misguided in, in their assumption that all men are bad, you have to understand the fear and the suspicion that this uh, reaction comes from. But to start blaming and the, the hashtags that I've seen are just uh, are just heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. So you're attacking women when they're going through a real moment of anguish and pain and horror. And you have to understand not to be not to be showing empathy at this time is perhaps the most cruel thing that anyone can do. And I'm I'm very sorry to say that I don't see that empathy, that understanding in 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 culture. And that's not only specific to Pakistan, but I see that where they you know we have hashtags of all women are bad and and where does that come from it comes from a lack of understanding and a lack of um an effort to understand you have to understand why women are saying that they're angry and and can you blame them not that i would say i would i i completely hear where you're coming from so other than that other than having to better understand or teaching people how to understand these kind of situations, what changes do you think need to be put in place to ensure that violence against women in Pakistan is better combated? So I think, first of all, as I said, that this, this everyone is not from a privileged class and even in the privileged class, women are not protected. So one of the most important things right now is the fact that if there's a past history of abuse, of, of, uh, of any kind of violence against women, or violence of any kind that needs to be shared when that person goes um, and and changes an address or or you know changes an employment and how and limit their interactions with the general public. I think that needs to be done, particularly for women and particularly also for for children. And I know that that is uh, now um, we have worked on that in in the UK, for example, which we uh, refer to as a CRB check. So I think this kind of information must be. Um, must be volunteered by different countries and and must be shared to protect women and children a lot better in in wherever if it's a perpetrator of violence with a past history of even mental health illnesses that needs to be shared to protect Mm -hmm. the community also i feel that there needs to be women protection centers and there needs to be allocation of budget for these women protection centers they need to be at provincial and a district level during the last regime uh, from 2013 to 2017, under the Chief Minister Punjab, uh, we had uh, a special unit, an SRU, um, and Salman Sufi and some other gentlemen and, and women were doing an absolutely brilliant job about not only women protection centers, which are essentially refuge centers, um, mm-hmm. but also uh, women policing or, or women constables who are trained to take down these uh, histories of, of violence or women uh, women to women sort of you know a reporting of crime uh, i think in, in a pakistani context to repay uh, to report molestation sexual assault rape domestic violence within the home there needs to be uh, police stations with the facility of a female constable who can in private and and, and in a sensitive environment take down uh, details of your case and then refer you to someone who can offer you protection. The Women Protection Bill uh, in 2016 that the PMLN introduced was heavily criticized by the own party also at the time. But this needs to be understood that we have a very, um, you know, the, the, the community policing is a non-existent in Pakistan. And many women will be, un, um, you know, would not be prepared to go to a police station and talk about domestic violence or something that they fear will be taken against them mm-hmm. uh, and, and how can they report someone who perhaps they're not even yet married to 
And that is a case, um, you know, where there are stalking incidents, where there's a blackmail uh, and, and online blackmail. We've seen the recent incident of Usman Mirza. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the fact that it's come to light has been much later, actually. The, uh, we, we now are listening to sources telling us that uh, the, the young woman in that incident and perhaps others might have been blackmailed for that video for a longer period of time before we saw it in, in social media. Mm -hmm. and, and so there needs to be that sensitivity to understand how can a woman go in and report this? Who does she talk to? You can't talk to teachers in school. You can't talk to your parents. You have no family support. Um, so there needs to be that understanding that there need to be some people who are trained to take down history or take down first incident reports um, about domestic violence or mm -hmm. the fear of assault or the fear of stalking. No, I absolutely agree. I absolutely love your ideas too. And I really hope at some point they might be able to implement that not only in Indopag, but maybe actually around the world. Going back to something you said before, you said victim blaming. Last month, PM Imran Khan made comments about how the rise in sexual violence against women is because women are not wearing the veil or purdah. What kind of impact have comments like these had on the culture of misogyny in Pakistan? Well, A, they're factually, you know, incorrect. Uh, the fact that we've just had a case uh, two days ago where a woman who was burqa clad, and I come from a region where women observe strict purdah, and, and I don't know... Uh, where uh, the now prime minister has been living but if he was living in pakistan um, it's not my information that women walk around in uh, you know uh, in in immodest clothing or or are wearing clothes that are obscene or vulgar that is not certainly my observation in pakistan in fact even visitors to pakistan foreign tourists and foreign journalists actually observe uh, pakistani norms and traditions of dressing up and so i've seen a lot of uh, white women who are new to the culture uh, become extremely respectful of, of our culture and our sensitivities fairly soon. And so I, I think that that is factually incorrect. Just a couple of days ago, as I mentioned, uh, in, in, a, in, a re, in a district in KP, a woman who was burqa clad was gang raped and, and was, was actually not only stripped naked um, and videoed, but they ran away with her clothes. And, and so I, I don't know where those comments are. They're not based on any factual or any sensible information. Uh, I also think that, yes, when you're in the public domain, even as a, as a celebrity, say you're a musician, say you're, you know, Atif Aslam or, or, or a tennis star or, or someone who's, who's not as famous as uh, the current prime minister has been, uh, surely he has had uh, enjoyed a celeb state as much bigger than anyone in Pakistan ever mm -hmm. has. And when people are copying your hairstyle and the way you talk, and mimicking your actions and your voice, you should be very conscious, very, very responsible with your choice of words. Um, you know, I, I, I've personally been very, um, uh, very deliberate about the choices of uh, clothing that I choose for myself. I, I'm very aware of the fact that in Pakistan, I think it's a bit vulgar to wear, wear very expensive uh, designer um, outfits or, or things that I think are, are not, you know, um, not compatible with with the way the society is is functioning so i make an a conscious effort mm -hmm. to dress more simply or or not to flash too much uh, expensive jewelry around because i think it's i just think that it's inappropriate i i want to encourage a culture that 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 has uh, that lays too much emphasis on on things that i think pakistanis cannot afford um but 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 also with uh, pardon me this is my uh, alarm going off but, but I think that it's, it's extremely important for people in the public domain to choose their words uh, very responsibly. So there, there are no, no two ways. I know that he's now retracted the statement and, and still in that retraction, he's justified it. You know, he has said mm -hmm. that it's been taken out of context. I'm sorry, but there is no way to take it out of context if you say, well, this is because. Yeah. So it has not been taken out of context if you use the word, you know, I think this is because there mm -hmm. is vulgarity in, in our society and right. that there is, we need to go back to basis and there is a lack of parda. A, there is no lack of parda in Pakistani society. I need mm. to inform people of that. B, parda has nothing to do with rape. Rape has nothing to do with sexual lust or desires. So he really needs, like I said, not only him, but many people need to be sat down for a gender training course for, mm. uh, for uh, a very simple awareness course in rape, 
is about violence. Rape is not about lust and about desire or being attracted to a female. If that were the case, men would not be abused. Young children would not be abused. Three-year-olds are not expected, a three-year-old, a four-year-old boy cannot walk around in burqas. What is he suggesting? So mm. A, it is, it's, a, it's, it's a nonsensical, uh, mindless comment. I think that he has done it more than once not to be, uh, not to be now conscious of the fact that he's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, I, I think in, in, in perhaps the Western uh, setting, he said it about two or three times, but we have been listening to it for a much, much longer time. And I think that he needs to be called out and an apology has to be clean. I was wrong and that's it. There is no justification for it. Mm -hmm. It is with victim shaming. It is a rape apologist comment and there are no two ways about it. And I think that people should have the courage to own up their mistakes. And if they do not do that, then we would be um, perhaps forgiven for thinking it's deliberate. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what is concerning to me. Why is it a deliberate? Is it a deliberate um, a sort of uh, uh, playing to the gallery, playing to the right wing vote bank? Because you see, these are the same people who sit in parliament and they have, when we see them uh, um, atop a container, uh, or, or in, in stadiums in the U.S., and they make these very loud, brash, aggressive comments about their opponents, why can't they stand up and show their masculinity or their manliness in the parliament and stand up for a domestic violence bill? Mm -hmm. Why are they dragging their feet on the domestic violence bill? And that doesn't only go for the prime minister or for the incumbent government. I must say that the, the lack of interest and 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 the the the, the cowardly approach to the, to the domestic violence bill and how it's been made controversial i think that all parties across the board have to be blamed for it and they are all playing to the gallery they're all being cowardly about it they're all um you know um bending down backwards to please the extreme right wing vote bank and i think there is no place for that in 2021 mm -hmm. this is not the reality of pakistan pakistan has very vocal feminist voices and there is nothing wrong in being a feminist and to be apologetic about feminism and to say that it's a western imported concept i think is an an insult to our islamic values mm -hmm. it's an insult to pakistani women vo voices and it is an insult to the pakistani political leadership that we see across the board which is essentially young and female so i think that they really need to uh, be given a crash course in where Pakistan is in 2021, it is not representative of the Pakistani um, electorate. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned feminism, but do you think sexism is embedded in Pakistan society? I think sexism is being perpetuated. I see sexism and misogyny as a social construct. I mm -hmm. think that it serves the old boys network. I don't see that as natural. I don't see that as something that nature intended. I also would go further and sort of say that even in the Pashtun, uh, sort of um, uh, society, uh, we have been racially profiled, and and it seems to be suggested that it's something that is uh, that is part of our culture. It's not. It is something which is fairly recent. I think it's a product of the the first Afghan war. Uh, the, it has ruined our social fabric. Yes, people observe parda, but if they wish to, but there was a a, a strong. Um, matriarchal uh, society actually traditionally which they are negating it is completely a social construct and messaging like the the now prime minister is uh, making a you know a deliberate effort to 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 promote uh, messaging on social media messaging on mainstream media uh, the sort of uh, um, the sort of support that it comes from you know, film actors and, and singers and, and media stars is, is regrettable. And I think that this is, again, uh, it, it, it's not realistic. It's not a promotion of reality in Pakistan. They're perpetuating a myth that has been implanted and enforced on mm -hmm. Pakistan. This is not an identity that I'm familiar with. I, I have worked with very remote, primitive uh, villages in, um, say, the tribal belt in in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Waziristan and uh, um, and and uh, Kohistan uh, in in Thar and and you know interior Sindh in South Punjab in Miawali his his own constituency. I have never experienced that kind of misogyny. 
I think that they respect women leaders. I think that they do want someone to um, uplift, uh, uh, you know, work for their uplift. They do want social upward mobility, they want poverty alleviation. Uh, no one anywhere has, has sort of asked me that I wish there was more parda in society. I wish that women were not educated. That is not my personal experience. I've been working for the last nine years in Pakistan and I'm in love with Pakistani people because I think that they are far more sensible than a lot of people who sit in parliament and on our TV as mouthpieces of those who want to perpetuate a myth that has been implanted. And I, I feel extremely angry about it. Mm -hmm. Is Pakistan's prevalence of violence against women unique to the nation or do you think it's a global issue? It's not unique to Pakistan because we see that, you know, whenever a man is, say, for example, let's look at the COVID lockdown figures and look at the COVID lockdown figures for the United Kingdom. Uh, we have better reporting, perhaps, so we can say this, uh, the, that, that the statistical evidence exists. In Pakistan, we don't have a, uh, any statistics to back my argument because people are not interested about it. But in the UK, for example, during lockdown, guess who suffered? 40% violence against women, domestic abuse during lockdown. Um, the England matches recently, uh, it was a sad statistic that if England had lost the finals, uh, they would be a 38% rise in violence against women in domestic abuse. Had they won it, there would have been a 27% increase in the violence against women. So it is a reality for women across the world. And when, when people talk about men's rights, yes, there should be men's rights. But here we are being treated as a minority. In the United Kingdom, for example, uh, we don't have as much an impressive or an equal share in Parliament as, as we should hope to in 2021. Certainly in, in places like India and Pakistan, where it's very difficult for a woman to step out of the house because of the number of issues that she faces. I mean, to, just to take the public transport, to go out for shopping. And these are women who observe very strict parta. And so how are we going to have more women in Parliament? We're not going to have more women in Parliament when we have messaging like that. So mm. it's, it's more of a problem for, for Pakistan because there is no reporting or poor reporting. There is a seriously um, uh, data that needs to be looked into. Uh, women are reluctant to report. Men are reluctant to report. And that the violence against women is so easy to get away with. I mean, mm. look at the acid attacks, for example. It t tends to be along a certain patch because the value of attacking women is, is you know, there's not a lot of attention paid to it. And then it's unhelpful when people stand up in parliament and say, oh, I feel under attack because men's rights are being attacked. When, uh, when a nation, so of course, there is violence against women in the US, there is violence against women in the UK, but at least we have some laws, at least we have some refuge centers. Here also we find that migrant communities uh, will be uh, at a disadvantage. Migrant communities or women in migrant communities will be at a disadvantage because of insecure immigration status, because of the family status as well. So it is a problem. I know that it is a huge, I work with a few organizations that work for uh, uh, Latin American women in the, in the UK. I work with a lot of women uh, who uh, organizations that work for uh, black communities, for Bengali communities, and certainly it is a problem for Urdu speaking or Indian origin and Pakistani origin mm. communities. But in Pakistan, we can't talk about it, a, a, a land where you're threatened by, by a piece of cardboard. You know, a woman is holding up a piece of cardboard and your men's rights are violated. What is the Aurat March? What are they being threatened with? Uh, they're threatened by a piece of paper. That is what threatens their, uh, their, their, their uh, masculinity. Mm -hmm. That is what is threatening their male uh, rights. I'm sorry, but if that kind of intolerance and the sort of attacks women uh, face uh, when they're carrying a few placards, when they're not allowed to even use their voice, and they're ostracized by society. They are shamed for that. The fact that they are assassinated for, for just raising their voices, and, and not to mention the character assassination of women like myself on, 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 on social media. I, I think that in Pakistan, there is a deeper problem that even if there were laws, the mindset has to change. Certainly, if the prime minister of the country, the biggest celeb in, in the country, doesn't have a clue about the choice of words what hope would we have from someone who is perhaps not even educated at Oxford and Cambridge? And so I think that it is a bigger problem in Pakistan because those who are the decision makers and policy makers are completely misguided. And, and that needs to be addressed, at least in the US. Uh, we hopefully under the new administration, we would hope that they're not that sexist um, 
um, a, a, a remark made in, in speeches or on social media. Mm -hmm. And when there was, in the previous administration, there was a backlash, and rightly so. Rightly so. No, absolutely. You just mentioned this previously, but some have opposed the Women's March for Freedom and Equality by arguing that feminism is a form of westernization. What are your thoughts on that? A few people who are threatened because women uh, are asking for what is their rightful place in society. I say that we are treated like a minority. We're not a minority. And also, I think that a lot of societies, particularly in Pakistan, women behave like a minority also. I think that women for women needs to be a concept introduced in Pakistan. We have a lot of misogyny coming from women, from family members, from women in uh, for, from women in society and even parliamentarians. I mean, if I uh, just uh, refer you to the recent incident where a female parliamentarian, a former parliamentarian and now a spokesperson for the CM Punjab insulted a woman a young woman in mm. public who was uh, on on a on a district management senior position. Uh, what is that? That is that is also perpetuating a misogynistic culture uh, where you are discouraging women who have it quite difficult. You know, for a woman to come into the public domain or to fight for a right to work, she has already fought so many obstacles. Uh, you know, she has probably fought her parents for that right. She has convinced her husband or in laws, and then to be be facing character assassinations and social media assaults. Uh, you know, people have mother-in-laws, father-in-laws, husbands and, and brothers. Mm -hmm. Everyone has not enjoyed the, the sort of freedom that Raham Khan enjoys. And everyone can't have that freedom. It comes with a price. And people have families. Women have families. People, women have young daughters who have to live in Pakistan, have to go to school and college. And, and so I think that um, why it's concerning is the fact that the, the attacks on Aurat March are just because I think that it's a few very chauvinistic, insecure, egotistical men who uh, cannot bear the fact that women are going to take their place and, and have far better abilities and more competency. Mm -hmm. that, that is a problem. It's an insecure man who doesn't want to give that space to women who are far better at the jobs uh, that perhaps they're failing at. It's as simple as that. And we need to see it as, as just that. No, absolutely. My final question to you, if you had to give or say something to the women or ladies or girls that are watching this right now, what would you say? So the one thing that I will say is that when you are going to ask for your rights, people, are, the first thing they're going to use is they're going to shame you. They're going to call you vulgar. They're going to say that you're breaking societal norms. They're going to say that you're going against tradition. But do not forget that women who were shamed for burning their bras, they got us the vote today. They were shamed for that. We have a vote because people were uh, doing things that were breaking or women were leading the fight and people were saying they're vulgar and they're obscene and they're breaking society, societal norms. So don't be afraid of that. The biggest weapon that men will use against a woman is shame. And if you de-weaponize them, disarm them, understand why someone is assassinating your character or, or shaming you on social media and, mm -hmm. and calling you all sorts of names, dragging you into the mud, resist that. Ignore that. You have to be brave. You have to be brave right now because this is the only weapon they have. They want you to stop. They want to silence you. And you must not fall in that trap. You must disarm them. If you take away that weapon of shame, what are they going to do? I mean, they've said everything about me. And one of the brilliant things that I, I think I must say that I appreciate about the Pakistani public is the fact that all sorts of things have been said about me. All sorts of things have been cooked up about, up about me. But the fact that the Pakistanis have ignored that. You know, Pakistanis don't care what you say about Raham Khan. They have rejected that propaganda. They have rejected any character assassination. They have uh, built my trust in them. And so I think that if you have more faith in the wider public and, and, and just stand up to the bullies, the bullies will back off. They will back off. I have so much faith in the younger women of today. And I want to tell everyone who's listening that if you think you can silence us and you can silence these women, people like us, women like us, will protect them. I will protect them from the front, will shield them from everything that they are being attacked uh, from. I, I see on Clubhouse women who are saying these things are attacked by random men. 
And I'm, I'm giving you this promise today that I will do that because I have two young daughters of my own. I will protect you from the front, shield you from that, uh, from that obnoxious behavior, and I will certainly support you from the back. Do not be uh, bullied down into silence. People want to break you down. They want to make you cry. That's what a bully wants, and you must understand that. You must understand that and not back off. You are on the right side of history. If you believe that you are right, then you should not apologize for your behavior. You should not back down. And and certainly I lead by example. So I'm not, I'm certainly practicing what I preach. This is what I tell my children. This is what I tell my daughters. I, I, I tell them that this is not the, this is not the time to back off. You have to fight back because people have fought back for us. We've come this far. We've not come as far as I would have liked to, but I certainly have, have, have complete commitment and I give you that com commitment that I will leave this world. I will leave this world a lot better than I found it. I do not want to give my daughters the world that I encountered, the world where women are deprived of the right to speak their mind and these rights, the right to think and the right to speak is a, give, is a given right by nature. It's not something that is that somehow we've cooked up. We were mm -hmm. meant to speak, we were meant to think, and men were not meant to think for us, and men were not meant to speak for us. And that's how nature intended, and, and, and it's about time we took our rightful place. I absolutely agree with every single word you just said. I want to thank you for joining me. I understand this might be a very sensitive topic for you to talk about as well. Thank you, thank you. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. You're watching the International News Channel on Tag TV. I am Simone Ivani. Don't forget to like, subscribe and turn on the bell notifications to stay up to date on our latest videos.